Welcome. Welcome to Fearless with Jason Whitlock. I am Jason Whitlock. Happy Wednesday. Happy hump day to you and yours. All right. Uh, we're going to pick up where we left off uh, yesterday. Uh, one of the greatest basketball players of all time has, has joined us for a two-part interview. We talked a lot about him and Gonzaga and their riff over wearing a mask and the vaccine and all that. Uh, and now today we're just going to talk some basketball with John Stockton. Uh, and so I want to start by first playing a clip uh, from Frank Layden, the old Utah Jazz coach, uh, in 1984 talking about uh, the selection of John Stockton. He was a surprise pick, I believe, at number 16. Uh, he's in the great 1984 draft with Michael Jordan, Hakeem Olajuwon, Charles Barkley, a bunch of people. And John Stockton at, at 16, I think play, I think Kevin Willis is in that draft and played 21 seasons. John Stockton played 19. Hakeem played 18. Uh, John Stockton has a case other than Michael Jordan. He was the best player in that draft. And, you know, look, Charles Barkley, Hakeem Olajuwon, don't call me, but <laughs> he has a case. Uh, anyway, uh, I want to play that clip, and then we're going to bring in John Stockton and talk about it. Offices. We may have a surprise for you. That surprise was revealed shortly after 11 o'clock this morning. The Utah Jazz select John Stockton of Gonzaga University. I think that we spend a lot of money and a lot of time, and we do a very good job at scouting. Why should we share that with anybody? Frank went on to add that the first scout to spot Stockton is a local Hall of Famer. Jack Gardner does our Pacific Coast scouting, and uh, he sees a lot uh, of, uh, of the Pacific Coast players on TV as well as live. He mentioned to me that he felt he was a very good player. The Jazz coaches then decided Stockton was the player they needed, an able backup to Ricky Green. He's a dangerous scorer. He's, he's uh, not as quick as Ricky, but he's very, very quick by, by most standards. And uh, he can score, and he's an exciting passer. I think he'll, he'll do some exciting things in our fast break. I think most of the scouts felt that if we didn't take him, uh, he would have been taken right after us by somebody else. And so I have, uh, we, we feel good about him. I mean, uh, you know, that he, he can come and make our team. Yeah, I was very surprised. The, uh, all indications were that if Portland didn't pick me 19th, it might be Portland early in the second round. So I, I even thought maybe second round at this point. Uh, rumors, of course, were flying. Very few of them said Utah, but uh, my dad called that he, he said Utah's going to pick you. And I said, sounds good to me. And, they and so that was Frank Layden saying, you know, they pulled the rug over people and, and pretended like they were going to take someone other than John Stockton. And that was John Stockton saying he thought he was going to go in the second round. His dad thought the Jazz were going to take him. Uh, he's the first player from Gonzaga to be selected in the first round. And so I'm going to ask, start here, John. What was more surprising or what's more unbelievable that you were a first round draft pick in the NBA or that you were able to play 19 seasons in the NBA? What's more shocking? I don't know. They're both, they're both still pretty shocking to me when I sit back and think about it. I mean, the, the, the year I was drafted, um, we played a early season tournament called the Far West Classic in Portland. And um, after that tournament, I had a good tournament apparently. And, and they said, the coach came up to me and said, hey, good news for you. Uh, looks like you might get drafted in the sixth or seventh round. And so, I mean, <laughs> as you can imagine, that means you're not, you're nowhere in the hunt. So, uh, you know, the, the thought that I'd ever be an NBA player, ever be drafted at any stage in my life was, uh, was such a long shot, it wasn't even worth discussing. So the 19 years wouldn't really be worth discussing either. They're both pretty, pretty surprising. I have to pinch myself. Yeah, and so listening you talk back then, you really seem to go into camp and that experience thinking, let me be the best backup for Ricky Green uh, <laughs> that I can be. You weren't thinking about okay, in three to five years, I want to be an all-star. I want to be an all-time great. You really just came in thinking about being a backup to Ricky Green? 
Yeah, if even that, I was trying to trying to fool them for a year. I, I literally, when we got to Salt Lake, I got an I got a furnished apartment, the cheapest one I could find. Uh, I went to a, a discount food shop and I bought some pots and pans. I made my mom's lasagna and froze it and put it in the freezer. I mean, I saved per diem. I saved everything. I was fairly convinced it was a one and done. Uh, they'd figure out that I couldn't play. And, and so, um, yeah, I, the, the whole thing, everything's great. Everything is gravy to me. I didn't think I'd last a year. So um, then we go to camp, of course. Um, actually kind of held out, believe it or not. But I did go to camp and uh, felt like, hey, I got a chance here I, I'm, I'm playing. I didn't think I was ever going to be a guy they would count on, but I, I got a chance of playing. I, these guys aren't, I called my old coach. These guys aren't that awesome was my quote. I mean, how do you, how do you weigh that? Not that awesome. <laughs> anyway, it is what it is. So one of the things I found in researching you that I had forgotten because hell when in 1984, I'm still in high school and, and I followed the NBA, but it's not like, you could see every game the way you can now. And so I had forgotten that you got to play early in your career with Adrian Dantley, who's one of the greatest scorers in NBA history. And then that made me go, hold on, Adrian Dantley's not one of the 75 greatest NBA players. He didn't make the all anniversary team. I mean, he led the league in scoring, I think, twice, averaged more than 30 points a game three or four times. I, did he play on a championship team with Detroit? I, I know he went to Detroit and I, I just can't, but I think about Carl Malone and his unique body and set of skills, but Adrian Danley had a very unique body, set of skills, and basically a six foot five power forward. What do you remember about AD? I remember a lot about AD. He, I, I, I watched him like a hawk and had the opportunity to play with him a ton. First of all, his preparation was was tremendous. He was always prepared. He, he his use of his body changes the speed, confidence. Uh, I mean, there was just so much about him. I think rubbed off. Carl Carl, um, I think gained some benefit from him as well. He only played one year with him. I was with him for two, but uh, yeah, Adrian's a special scorer at six five. Like you said, he he scored in the post with with clever deliveries and changes of pace. I mean, everybody could learn by watching old highlights of Adrian. I'm going to tell you the other thing that, switching back to you and just what's so unique about you, particularly when you watch today's basketball. And, and you'll have to correct me because, again, did you ever dribble between your legs or behind your back? Now, I'm being, because now it's like you can't bring it up court without dribbling between your legs and taking it behind your back. But I, I don't remember you doing it. There was no mustard to your game. It was the most fundamental and basic game that you could play at a point that, a, particularly at a position that handled the ball that much. A am I right in remembering that? I don't remember. You just didn't dribble between your legs the way these guys do now. No. And, and so was that a strategy? What, what, what was that? Well, it's it's obviously different. I, I did. You have to have it used every tool. So did I practice dribbling between my legs? Absolutely. Behind my back? Absolutely. And used all of them. I and mean, there wasn't a spin move. I used. I mean, I used every move. All these guys are using them. I just didn't use five of them at a time and uh, tried to be as efficient with it as I as I possibly could. And, and so, yeah, I mean, between the legs was, was once or twice. It just kind of sets it up and puts it in the right side without putting the ball at risk. Similarly with behind the back, if a guy lunges at the ball and you can just take it away and put it on the other side, you've gained a quick advantage. But but really, I didn't see any, any reason to waste waste it um, just for the look. I mean, we, we got where we, the object is to get where you want to get when you want to get there. So on the right right place at the right time and things work for you. So try to keep it simple. All right. So some of the greatest players have said some of the greatest things about you. Charles Barkley says, the best pure point guard ever. Uh, St Magic Johnson, he's the best leader he's played against. Gary Payton said, <laughs> it was more difficult to defend John Stockton than Michael Jordan. <sighs> I don't know if the praise can get any higher <laughs> than that. 
What, do you agree or what, what, what's your reaction when you hear all-time great players saying things like that about you? Well, it's uh, especially now. I mean, we're friends with all those guys now. Uh, you know, you, it, it affords the opportunity to say nice things about them that you would have never said when we were playing against each other. And it's always appreciated. I mean, you, let's, let, I mean to be appreciated by your by your coaches your teammates your fans though that's big that's just really big and then opponents is a whole nother step and i mean i have uh, we could take those three guys and i could talk for a half hour complimenting them uh, i mean magic johnson i think is one of the best all-time players and in the in the in the hunt for the best of all time uh charles Barkley is one of the best people i've ever been around i watched i watched him do things that 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 um we're so kind and so giving, uh, in addition to what we see, you know, the personality that we see, he, he shares that with everybody. Uh, Gary Payton, again, he's another guy that's become a friend over the years and, and his contribution to the game, to Seattle, the Washington state. And, um, you know, you just can't, you can't quantify any of that. It's, uh, these guys are great players. I talk about them forever, but that's a quick snippet. So, um, you know, it, it makes me proud to, to hear those things. Um, feels good. We we ended the first interview with you talking about Isaiah Thomas, and and you made reference to I think meeting him maybe as a high school player and it opening your mind to like oh even though I'm undersized and small I can compete at the highest level. Then you talked about while you guys were in the NBA you were at each other's throats and there was real animus there. Com good competitive animus and then you get to the end of your career you get inducted into the Naismith Hall of Fame and Isaiah Thomas is introducing you what happened how did, how did y'all go from such fierce competitors to the guy that introduces you at the Hall of Fame well the guy the guy I fought most with on a basketball court in my entire life was my older brother and yet I love him right so and, and I mean, I had more bloody knees and elbows and foreheads and whatever. It's it's tough to be a little brother, but it's, you know, he's he's my best friend. And so um, I think that that carries on. So uh, we had knockdown dragouts with Isaiah and the, and Detroit, obviously. Um, I admired him. He I mean, he he raised the level for me as a high school guy. I got to watch him through college. He's just a little bit older than me. And, and, and amazed and, and I learned by watching and then I he was in the league well before me and I got to watch that so um his, his how he competed against me and how he uh responded after games was always something that I appreciated uh when he had retired but he had started coaching he pulled me aside a couple of times and just offered a little you know a little pat on the backs you know with with suggestions that that just couldn't have been better timed and, and and more helpful than they were. So when it came to, to see who would announce me, there, it was an easy choice. I mean, there was just really nobody else I could think of that, that impacted, impacted my life so many times um, as him. So again, good friend, uh, continues to be so, and um, I'm grateful for that relationship. And so in 1992, when the Dream Team controversy is raging uh and and i can't imagine you guys were that cordial back then but maybe you were uh to, you know you've already admitted that when you guys were playing against each other it was very competitive and some little anger fueling on both sides but how did you handle the dream team controversy because there were two separate ones there was well, Michael Jordan didn't want Isaiah on the team. And then there was, how could they put John Stockton on the team ahead of Isaiah Thomas? Did you and Isaiah ever talk about that then? And do you ever talk about it now? Uh, it's come up now. Well, I, I got to tell you, neat, one of the neat things that he did, I mentioned that he's come into my life a number of times and, and done impactful things. So that, that whole selection went down again. I. I was surprised when I got the call in the first place. I didn't believe it when I got the call. I had to call our team to confirm it. Um, so before I said yes, and so 
you know, kind of the standard for me is is my expectations were that I, I would never be selected for a team like that. So then I'm selected. Well, I don't, I don't look a gift horse in the mouth. I, I just get prepared and do it. And so who else was on the team was kind of irrelevant to me or who wasn't. Uh, I was asked, I have a job to do, let's go. And so um, then the controversy comes out. But as I mentioned, I don't read the newspaper. I don't have social media, which didn't even exist then. Uh, so I only heard about it on the on the days that we were playing Detroit, which is only twice a year. So, um, you know, and then you heard about it a lot. And, you know, I, I think, you know, Isaiah, I'll tell you, he put a couple Whopper games together that year. I'll tell you that he was a load and a half to try to play against. But, uh, you know, there was a point there. But what that special thing that he did amidst all the, the, the noise on it, he found a way to call my dad. I mean, I don't know how you hear how he would even do that, but he called my dad personally. He didn't have a secretary call. He didn't have, you know, he called my dad and just kind of explained that he felt that he belonged as well. Not that it was John or me and that John shouldn't have. And, and I tell you, my dad uh, uh, so much appreciated that and it put him at such ease. And um, again, I'm so grateful for that. I, I, I don't know if I'd have been big enough to do that. That's for sure. And so, um, you know, that put everything at ease in my camp for sure. When did that, did that happen in 92 or years later? That happened and that happened pre-Olympics. So, um, you know, that whole year was, was apparently the, the year of tension, but, um, you know, for what it's worth and, and my, my parents and my family always felt the tension more. I think they watched the news, <laughs> you know, they watched the news, they read the newspapers and, for, for being a family member of an athlete, it's probably more difficult than the athlete. You just go do your job, but they have to hear all the night and the bad things said about you and whatnot. So um, that, that was that year. And again, it's pretty neat. Very neat. The other thing that I think is, and, and <laughs> neat in a different way, I, I have to and I can say this because <clears throat> Isaiah has shared with me that he's also become very good friends with Carl Malone. Uh, but clearly, your relationship with Carl Malone is one of the most unique experiences, I think, in basketball. Because, <clears throat> look, Scottie Pippen and Michael Jordan, look at the tension between them. Uh, Shaq and Kobe uh, clearly had tension. <clears throat> it seems from afar. Carl Malone and John Stockton was nothing but love to the point that <clears throat> when when Carl Malone <laughs> felt like uh, he needed to stand up for you or I don't know knock Isaiah down a peg or two he did it uh, and so I, I the 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 bond between you and Carl Malone is I, I don't know what I would compare it to in sports. Uh, you know, I don't think Magic and Kareem, not that they didn't get along, but they were such different guys. I, I don't think <clears throat> they had that kind of brotherly bond that you and Carl Malone have. Uh, tell me about your relationship with, with Carl, the mailman, and, and just why you two, uh, and maybe it's because you're both kind of small town. I know C Carl's from the south and the country uh-oh <laughs> uh, uh yeah just go your, your relationship with carl malone it's hard to well it is what it is I, I carl and i met in the 1984 olympic trials which we neither one of us made that team that was uh, coached by coach knight um, we're going to a lunchroom one day. We don't know each other from Adam and, uh, there was a table open and Carl and I just kind of plunked down next to each other and started a conversation. And it was unbelievable how easy the conversation was. It was, you know, there, that was a tense time. There was what 80 of us or 70 of us, something like that, all practicing and trying in three practices a day, two hours each to try to make a team of 12. And so, you know, it was all cordial, but there was there was no love loss between probably anybody there. But he, he this this kid from Spokane, that country kid from Louisiana, sat down on a table and had a conversation that that lingered. You know, we we enjoyed the talk. So fast forward two years, I, I I go on to the Jazz, and Carl finishes college, and 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 he gets drafted by the Jazz, and 
I said, man, that's kind of a coincidence. I, I know that guy. You know, we I'd even almost almost call him a friend. We we had a nice conversation. So he comes to Salt Lake and he and I go walking through Hogel Zoo up there together one day and just kind of reacquaint ourselves and and we weren't wrong. We were there there was something there. We we were going to be buddies. And then when we got on the court there, I, I felt there was something magical. The guy read my mind. Um, he caught everything. He finished everything. He had uh, all my work ethic and then some. Um, he, he loved the game. And just one thing after another, just kind of bond, 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 bond. Um, to where now he's he's literally inseparable for me as a brother. I mean, we don't see each other every day. We talk occasionally on the phone. But, uh, you know, that, that term's probably overused. But there's nothing I wouldn't do for Carl Malone. And I think there's... I think he feels the same way. So, I, I listening to you to describe it from afar, we would think, well, okay, this is Joe Montana and Jerry Rice, that John Stockton's the quarterback and Carl Malone's the receiver, but you kind of described it a little bit. It's more of a combination. He read your mind and understood how you played and you read his mind and understood how he played. It, it just seemed like such a natural fit. Uh, I don't know, you handed the mailman the mail and he'd stuff it in your mailbox. <laughs> well, you don't hand the mailman the mail if he doesn't deliver. You know, there's a reason why <laughs> it looks for him. I mean, I, I can think of a pass, it's, it's, it's one of the most memorable plays for me that, that, that largely went unnoticed, but Seven foot four, Ralph Sampson was on the low side of Carl, just draped over him. There's nothing but his long arm completely shielding any passing angle for Carl at all. And of course, I have a guy guarding me. And I don't know why I threw it, and I don't know how this came to be, but I threw the pass behind Ralph's head. And Carl's looking this way. And just as I started to throw, he wheeled and caught it behind Ralph's head like that and laid it up. And I went, wow. What what was that? I mean, he is literally reading my mind because I threw a dart. I mean, it's it was probably going to knock the cameraman out if it got through, and he just snapped it up, laid it up like it was nothing, and we went down the other way. I said, "There's there's something special about this guy," and that was very very early in our career because I you know by the time by the using Ralph as an example, it is early in our career. All right, let me tell you about my friends at Patriot Mobile. If the truckers have taught us anything. It's that we're infinitely more powerful when we stick together. The same goes for supporting businesses that believe in this country and your right to live free. That's why I'm proud to partner with Patriot Mobile, America's only Christian conservative cell phone provider. They use the same towers as the major carriers, so you get the same great nationwide coverage. Patriot Mobile has plans to fit any budget, and their 100% U.S.-based team provides exceptional customer support. More importantly, Patriot Mobile shares your values and supports religious freedom, constitutional rights, and sanctity of life. Go to patriotmobile.com Jason or call 972-PATRIOT. Get free activation with the offer code Jason, that's J-A-S-O-N, Veterans and first responders save even more. So make the switch today. Support a company that loves America, loves you, and shares your values. PatriotMobile.com slash Jason or call 972-PATRIOT. More with John Stockton. Thanks. So, obviously, Carl, we're going to take Carl off the table as best guys you played with or against uh, in the NBA. Uh, when you start thinking of the two or three guys that, that you would, and from your era, that you would pay money to see because you just love the way they approach the game, love the way they play the game, and they were going to dazzle you, who comes to mind most easily? <sighs> Well, I was always pretty impressed with in in the time when I was growing through that was both the Lakers and the um, and the Celtics were perennial, you know, opponents in the finals, and um, you, you know, it probably sounds cliche ish, but I, I I've always enjoyed watching that that battle with the Bird and, and Magic, um, two people that I think dramatically impacted our game in a positive way and and, and incorporated passing. 
um, made their teammates better. They all thought ahead of the plays. I mean, those guys are very, very obvious for me. Um, I can name a bunch of point guards who I, I dial, you know, locked horns with a lot. And certainly I, early on Isaiah and then, um, you know, Kevin Johnson was a, was a epic battle for me a lot out West. We played Phoenix a ton in the season and then we seem to play him every year in the playoffs. Terry Porter, um, later on Gary, of course, Gary Payton, um, you know, really lots more too. Those are just ones that are coming off the top of my head, but, uh, so many great players. That's what makes it fun. You mentioned the rivalry, and it was just a couple times a year, but Isaiah and yourself. Then you just now mentioned Magic and Bird, who have become friends. But when they competed against each other, there was some real animus there. That, and I'm not asking you to dump on today's game, but that does seem to have changed in this era, that there aren't Team rivalries, there doesn't even seem to be player rivalries. <laughs> Everything seems to be super friends. And, you know, I'm 54, I'm old. Uh, I, I miss that part of the game. I miss, you know, like, okay, Isaiah's going up against Stockton and I'm an Isaiah guy. And, and I, growing up, I was a Magic Johnson guy. I'm from Indiana, but uh, Magic Johnson for about a year dated my sister and uh, it just, I'm a Magic Johnson nut. I used to keep my own stats because I thought the statisticians, when he and Bird played, I kept my own stats because I thought the statisticians were cheating for Larry Bird. <laughs> you know, now that they're both gone, you know, I respect them both and, and think the world of both of them. Uh, but, but that element is missing from today's game. Am I right about that? Well, I doubt it's missing. It certainly isn't the same. Um, I mean, guys are hugging after games now. I, I can't even imagine that. We had, I had teammates that were traded or moved to another team, and and uh, we would joke about it if, I, if we crossed each other's paths in the summertime. Is God, you, we acted like we hated each other's guts. We played as if what well, we kind of do for a few minutes, you know, for a few, you know, forty eight minutes. Well, I don't, we do hate each other's guts, so. Now it seems a little cozier. I think that's part of the AAU influence. These kids grow up together and, you know, the the special elite teams or whatever come up as a group. They play each other over and over again. Maybe there's a there's a bond there that I don't understand, but I certainly didn't grow up with that. Uh, I, For me, I kind of like you. I, we're paying the gladiators out there to be gladiators. Uh, you know, go out there and go to, go to battle. It isn't, um, it isn't buddies. So uh, I'm not making the assessment of the current group, but uh, that's what I like to see is when people – compete tooth and nail that's that's what's exciting to me and so we have another clip of and you've probably seen this before but Steve Kerr Charles Barkley I think Reggie Miller a bunch of guys on NBA TV sitting around talking basketball and Steve Kerr tells a story uh, about you and he calls you a dirty bastard and he says it with affection and you know just like no 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 John Stockton, and I think Charles jumps in and says, yeah, John Stockton definitely pushed the envelope. He, he would, you know, people don't understand this, but John Stockton, and again, they said it with affection, but they called you a dirty bastard. And we played Utah two years in a row, six games, so 12 games against John Stockton. Mm -hmm. And I have the greatest respect for him. I see him away from the court, love him, great guy. But he was a dirty bastard. <laughs> oh! Whoa! Dirty, whoa! Dirty bastard! Whoa! Steve Kerr! Oh, I'm letting it out. I'm oh, letting it out. I'm letting it go. go. I've never seen a therapist about this. I'm gonna. This is my time let to it go. Let it there out. you go. Oh, I can tell you feel oh, better. Oh, oh, take the couch. Oh my God! John, John was a person that. Would this stretch is the, the this boundaries. Is the, the PG version of what yeah, like a person. Am I allowed to say was, that word on TV? It's <laughs> already sure. you got it. You on NBA TV, you are. You can say a lot worse than Come that. Come on. No, 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 NBA TV, I don't. <laughs> you can say that. Uh, I want your, your reaction. Do you remember Steve Kerr? Have you, have you seen that clip before where Steve Kerr says this? And do you feel like you were a guy that pushed the envelope? Well, it depends, it depends on what you mean, you know, push the envelope. So, um, and again, I'm going to take it as, I know Steve pretty well. 
And um, I'm taking it as a compliment. I mean, you're 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 not out there to be somebody's buddy. I'll tell you, when guys set screens on me, uh, some of the injuries I took is I took so many thigh bruises, I can't even tell you how many ice downs and stretchings and things I had to do because those guys stick a knee out or they stick their elbow out or they stick a shoulder or their hip uh, or clothesline. How many times I was clothesline. I remember Lambeer once just running down the court. He just gave me a little shot right there, got some stitches. So uh, it's dog eat dog. Now you can either be the guy that gets knocked down and then says, okay, you're right, you're big, I'm little. I'll just stand out here and snipe from 30 feet or you go back into the fray. And so I think I'm more of a go back into the fray guy. If that's dirty, I'll, I'll wear it. But uh, personally, um, uh, just like you mentioned before in our, our earlier interview, you tried to play honorably, uh, not not softly. And uh, however it's taken at this point, I can't change it. So the He definitely said it with affection uh, and with respect. The other thing that you just mentioned that a lot of people talk about and, and just kind of goes unnoticed, people consider you one of the best screening point guards in the history of basketball. That John Stockton at six foot one, 165 pounds, set some of the best screens in basketball. I, I would have to assume that was just something you did and you took pride in. And, and you didn't care about the lumps you took. You had a screen to set and you were gonna do it as hard as anything else you did on the court. Well, it doesn't, I'm only, you mentioned I'm only 175 pounds. And so to do it hard isn't really how it works. I think there's a, you have to try to be clever. I mean, you're screening, if you can get a mismatch, you can get a guy my size guarding Carl, that game's over. And so, um, you know, you try to get a body on a person that they where they don't have an angle to gain leverage on you. You try to get it in my case where they couldn't elbow you in the head as they're trying to fight through the screen, right? Um, so you put your head in a place where they can't get to it. Um, you try to figure out the angle that Carl's trying to go or somebody else you're setting the screen for and try to be clever. And then you just hold your ground. I had a trainer at Gonzaga who, who, who's become and still is one of my all-time best friends, Steve DeLong. And he used to joke, he was a wrestler. He used to talk about, I anchor myself to the center of the planet. And he, he says it, he doesn't smile or joke about it, but I get what he means. And so when I'd go in there and set the screen, I'd try to anchor myself to the center of the planet so that I couldn't be budged. And, you know, if you're low enough, uh, the weights balance out a little bit. So I took pride in him. I was asked to do it a lot. Jeff Hornacek on our team was also asked to screen a lot. And um, heck, if it makes your team better, why not? So... I think most people would say the three-point shot you hit over Charles Barkley in 97 sent Utah into the NBA Finals. We would call that your greatest memory or our greatest memory of John Stockton. It's maybe not one of your assists, but that's our version of you know, how we're going to remember you. What's your greatest on-court memory? Well, that's got to be right up there. I mean, it's um, we had some great times. There was a, there was wins in the finals that would fit into that category. We didn't win the finals, so it doesn't have the same impact. That that shot still kind of gives me goosebumps, and because I, I what what led up to it. I mean, we lost a port. We we were in the conference finals six out of eight years um, and couldn't get over the top. And whether we lost to Portland with Clyde Drexler or whether it was. Houston with Elijah on and, and Barkley and, you know, all these guys. I mean, it was just what we always had another hump to get over. We'd get over one and we get the Lakers behind us. And then all of a sudden Houston's the great team. So there was always one hump we could never get over. And we kind of exercised all those demons in one, in one game there um, in one time. And, and it all kind of culminated with that shot. So for all of us, it was uh, it was relief um, you know, ecstasy, the whole deal. It was, um, you know, I get goosebumps when I think about it and I, I think about it, not so much as me making the shot either. And they sound weird, but I remember the response our t of the team. I mean, it was, it was just so, so special with time. We, we were going to someplace we'd never, we'd worked so hard to get to and never gotten to before. So that was a pretty special moment. All right. Let me give you goosebumps. The other direction. Uh, we had Ken Maurer on this show. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I played him the clip of Michael Jordan hitting the game-winning series game six shot 
uh, where he allegedly, some say, pushed off against Byron Russell. Ken Maurer, 36-year NBA ref. We watched the clip and he says, there is no push off. Jordan just faked Byron Russell out of his jock and hits a great shot. Uh, John Stockton, did Michael Jordan push off? I, without a doubt, he pushed off. Now, whether you call it or not, it's another story. First of all, I, Brian kind of gets a bad rap for all that. Brian, I think, held Michael to the lowest shooting percentages of any of his finals, and, and he did the primary job of guard. He did a heck of a job. Michael's Michael. He makes, a, obviously, a huge shot. He he gave him a little nudge. I mean, that, there's a lot. If it's not called, it isn't a foul. And, uh, man, you, 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 if you're an offensive player in this league, you know how to – you know how to use your body. You know how to gain leverage. You know how to find ways to get your shot. So, uh, you know, I don't have any animosity towards anybody. If you pushed a little bit, it wasn't called. There you go. Simple. All right, let me ask you about playing until age 41, I believe. You, you were kind of a, the Tom Brady of basketball. Sure, it would be nice to have seven titles, uh, <laughs> but, you know, Looking at t being able to play at a high level until age 41, because if you wanted to sneak in another year, you probably could have. Uh, I think you averaged double digit scoring uh, your final season in the NBA. But do you ever look at what Tom Brady's doing? And, and you guys probably share, I don't know if you were TB12 and thought about everything you put into your body to in order to survive. I don't know if you were the health nut that Tom Brady was, but, but what I look at with, with Tom Brady is he's organized his life in a way to where he can still be successful as an athlete, high level athlete, all the way up to age 44, 45. And that's where I see similarity. It seems like you organized your life. You got settled in your family with your kids and all that. And, and you and your wife built a life that allowed you to play until age 41. But do you ever look at Tom Brady and, and see similarities between you and he? And I know, again, that I don't, you're a modest person. Brady's got seven Super Bowls, but you both playing at a high level for a long time. Well, yeah, I wish there were more similarities. The, uh, that guy's kind of special. I mean, he's... Uh, Kind of as, as they might be the understatement of the century, but we're talking the greatest of all time. And, um, you know, I don't, but I guess I'll bounce it. Do I see some comparison? Yeah, I think that there's a, there's a, a mental preparation that I, I would like to think that I adopted some of that, some of that stuff. Uh, clearly not as successful. One thing I, and I chat about him a little bit with our kids, is that one thing I guarantee will happen with them is when he does retire, I think he's, I think he's back to unretired again. Um, yeah. but when he does retire, he's going to find out he gets old real fast. So now you're in the locker room with all these young guys and you're, you're you and it's never changed. And then you're going to quit. And then two years later, you're 50. You know what I'm saying? Just like that. You're 50. And so you mother, mother nature, father time, uh, it's going to be quite a shock to him in a few years, but I, I do nothing but admire that guy, uh, over and over again. I sit there and watch him and he's a marvel, absolute marvel. I know exactly what you're talking about. You're in a locker room and he's 45 and there's 20 and 21 year olds in that locker room. And so he's hearing their language and slang. And then all of a sudden you retire and you're two years away and they're speaking a totally different language. The music's changed, every, you know, what movies just came out you don't know anything about because you're off in a whole different world yeah. and environment. Uh, than the young people. Uh, hey, Dwayne Wade has an ownership stake uh, in the Utah Jazz. And I was wondering if, did NBA ownership or being part of an ownership group, did that ever cross your mind? Um, I, I had a guy mention it to me once. It wasn't associated with the team. He just um, was trying to figure out if I would ever be interested at some time. I don't know. It's never been it's never been put before me in a, in a real way. So I haven't spent any time thinking about it. So not really, no. Final question. I'm going to let you go. And I really appreciate this. Uh, one thing that I have, because I've been to Salt Lake for some NBA games. I've been to Salt Lake uh, for some college basketball games. 
uh, back when I was an on the road sports journalist and always had a good time and was always treated well in, in Utah. And over the last few years, and, and I've heard a lot of people uh, criticize jazz fans. And a lot, I'm not gonna ask you, because I don't want to drag you into controversy, but a lot of it, was, to me, was driven by Russell Westbrook. And, and I, I'm, I don't want to drag you into a Westbrook controversy. I'm not a big fan of Russell Westbrook, and I, I don't like the way jazz fans have been smeared. And so I, I just, when I think about Utah, I really think about you and Carl Malone, uh, the peanut butter and jelly of Ebony and Ivory of the NBA. And, and it, it seemed like th this whole thing of demonizing jazz fans seems like a kind of a new thing that wasn't there when, when you guys were playing. And so I just wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about your experience with jazz fans and how they were perceived during your playing time. Well, first of all, and I'm not going to get into controversy with Westbrook, but there's all, my dad used to always say it, it's a strange pancake that doesn't have two sides. And how, how, how any altercation can take place almost anywhere and really not have another side is, uh, is always interesting to me, and yet it happens a lot, right? So my experience with Utah fans was phenomenal. Uh, obviously, we were the home team. I didn't sit over on the other bench and, and have to hear the things, but I, I sat in other arenas, and I've had – things said to me, I think there's, I mean, we have expectations of that we're gladiators. We're going out there. You can expect, you can expect a fair amount of, of not so nice things said to you and you have to wear it. And if you don't wear it, that's your problem. You know, if you walk to a locker room, it's, it's water off the back, off a duck's rear end. Right. So, um, you know, another statement I always grew up with or was told a lot was, don't wrestle with pigs. You know, all you end to do is end up getting dirty. The pigs end up liking it. And so, so as a player, you walk out, there's no problem. And so, uh, you know, he, that, that, that pancake has two sides, but I love the fans in Utah. They are great to me. They're great to my family. They continue to be great. And they're, and they're there every day. So. You made the point that, that I actually wanted you to make. And so I'm, a, I'm going to, asked you to elaborate and clarify just one last time, because I can't imagine, particularly after 91 and 92, it was a treat for you to go play in Detroit. And I would just have to imagine things were said to you in Detroit. I used to, I used to, I lived in Ann Arbor. Some of my best friends are from Detroit. I've gone to basketball games at the Palace, uh, you know, back in that time. And, and so you made the point that I, we love to act like fan animus only travels one direction and as if uh, that John Stockton and Larry Bird and every white player had rose petals thrown at their feet uh, every time they entered an NBA arena. And I just that's just not the case. And, and part of it is I'm a John, I'm a nut. I'm a Indiana Pacer nut or I used to be. I mean, as a kid, I'm from Indianapolis. Uh, my dad grew up taking us to ABA basketball games. I used to be a nutty fan. I went, when I was 17 or 18, uh, the Pacers, I went to the Pacers draft party and w I wanted us to select Adrian Branch in the second round. And they, I think they drafted Billy Martin, a kid that played at Georgetown in the second round. And I started yelling and screaming. I'm not, as, I'm not proud of this, but I started yelling and screaming and cursing at Donnie Walsh from up in the stands and he could hear me. He's down on the floor and he's looking up at me and I'm calling him every name in the book. Why didn't we take Adrian Branch, you dumb mofo, blah, 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 blah. And so I just know what fans are capable of because I used to be a, an idiot one. And, and I just love what you said in terms of like, it's part of the job. They pay you a bunch of money. You get treated like a king most places but fans are gonna yell stupid stuff and you just gotta be man enough to ignore it. Without a doubt, yeah, Larry Miller used to say that. He said that it takes way more courage not to lash out back than it does to, to lash out. I mean, it's, and yet I think guys look at it the other way and I think they're mistaken. There's some, there's some great personalities in this. Again, I didn't engage in it much and 
Some guys did, but there's some great personalities. You mentioned Detroit, Leon the Barber. I don't know if you've ever heard of Leon. He'd, he'd come before the game when you're out there shooting, and it was one derogatory comment after another, uh, white, black. I mean, he included everything, and he left. He spared no one. It was kind of – it kind of became fun. You know, it's um, – and the, the guys that engaged in it enjoyed the banter. There was a guy, a big John Sudsbury in Salt Lake, where – a lot of the better players on another team would come and they'd spot him and say something to him and he'd say something back and they enjoyed the banter. Um, you know, to, to start saying that that you can't do that because one guy gets mad about it, that, that's unfortunate. Um, if you choose to engage it, you, it can be civil, fun, and even a little bit derogatory. And so what? It's it's part of life and it, it's never bothered me. But um, yeah, that you look up Leon because Leon was quite the personality and everybody that played in that era knows who I'm talking about. Everybody. John, uh, thank you so much for the time. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, I'm over, you know, now that I know you and Isaiah are such great friends, Isaiah doesn't choose bad friends. It's an honor to have met you and interviewed you. I hope we stay in touch. I really appreciate the things you've said. Uh, and I know people will disagree about the COVID stuff and, and just standing up for young people. And, and I, I appreciate you talking about your faith the most uh, because we got to do that in this era or this country is going to get taken from those of us that uh, it's been too good to all of us for us just to let these people take it away from us. So thank you so much and uh, continued success. I agree with that. Thank you very much, Jason. It's been fun talking to you and uh, we will stay in touch. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you. All right. That's your Wednesday treat. John Stockton, Tuesday and Wednesday. That was good stuff. Talking to an all time NBA great. Uh, that's tomorrow, I hear. So that means uh, we'll see you. Tomorrow. Nothing in life like freedom. Came like a fighter, striking like a ladder, making all this moves for freedom. I want freedom. No negotiation, my system, no relation. We all just want to have freedom. Sitting on the corner, never been alone. I'm breaking my back for freedom. Bless, we are living, get back. We are receiving all the when We all want to be free. We want freedom I just want, I wanna be I just